once again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Jackson, uh, an associate professor here at NC State, uh, a good colleague and friend of, of Brian Whipker, and it's it's great to be here today and to talk with you about a, about something that I've been working with for about 10 years. And that's not just substrates, but more specifically the use of wood fiber and other wood processed components or processed wood components in substrates. Uh, over the past 10 years, from my graduate education all the way through uh, the past six years as a faculty member, I've, I've kind of focused my efforts on what I have thought for, for almost a decade to be the, the revolution, the, the, the evolution of, of growing media in the in 21st century would be wood fiber. And, and I, I am more strongly convinced today that that is the case coming forward, moving forward, than I was even uh, six months or a year ago. So the purpose of this seminar today, or this webinar rather, is to kind of update you all on some of the things that I am seeing, some of the things that I am hearing from around the world, and as well as here in the United States about the use of wood fiber. And I guess my main objective for you is to, to educate you on some of the things that are going on, as well as to, to present you with some, some questions or some things that I would encourage you to be aware of as, as new marketing propaganda, and new marketing techniques and, and new products are and will be becoming available in the market. Some things and some questions that you can ask so that you are well informed. Uh, before we go too much further, I, I first want to thank three institutions. Uh, there are many others who contribute to the, to the research of this program and many others, but the Golden Leaf Foundation, uh, a, a tobacco buyout settlement program where money is available for alternative crops and cropping systems, uh, in North Carolina has been a tremendous uh, funding uh, agency for this program in the past three years. So we're very thankful for them, as well as Berger Peat out of Canada and other peat companies as well. But for some of this work specifically, Berger was instrumental. And m much of what we do is, is not only funded by, uh, but is in close support of the American Floral Endowment. Okay, so horticultural substrates. Uh, I, I came up with the idea a year, year and a half ago with my colleague Bill Fontenot about how can we relate to the general public in an educational way as to what the significance of substrates are to all that we do. And I don't just mean in floriculture crops, and greenhouse crops, and nursery crops, but from, from everything from tree seedlings uh, to, to the Arapidopsis that are grown in research uh, chambers in, in more of the basic biological uh, labs, and, and we came up with the idea of Atlas, and of course Atlas being the Greek uh, mythology uh, hero who's holding the world in this, in this opinion, in, in, this, in this caption, and we think that, or at least I think that horticulture is, is the world that, that Atlas is holding, and of course Atlas himself is, is uh, substrates. Okay, with that being said, that's, that's, that's something that uh, always trying to really reach out and to, to show the significance of what we do. Uh, the last thing I'll say about the significance of substrates is this. Uh, one of the things that, that I have, am working on and I struggle with at times is the fact that I cannot justify the value of substrates in production because there are no numbers, and by numbers I mean dollars, associated with the sale and the use of substrates, whereas for pretty much any other crop, being grown, be it field crops, vegetables, blueberries, for small fruits, floriculture, there's a value, uh, a farm gate value for that. We do not have that for substrates. But when you combine both the professional and the retail world, it is in the billions and billions of dollars, both from a manufacturing standpoint as well as the grower cost standpoint. One of the key things today is, is, is sustainability in all aspects of what we do and whatever definition you may have of sustainability or whatever use of sustainability in your production system is, is, can be variable and can change by grower or by individual. But sustainability is something that in the, the media marketing and the media manufacturer world uh, is something that is very, very important and continues to be an issue. I'll hit on some of these sustainability issues today. I've learned that starting with names and the variance in naming of different products is something that is vastly different across all aspects of horticulture. So I like to start kind of getting us all on the same page as far as what is what and what is not. Substrate is, is, is used pretty universally, but it is more of an academic term 
sometimes than it is a grower term. Potting soil, potting media, potting mix. Some just refer to their potting substrate as a mulch. And then specifically for the wood, is it a wood fiber? Is it wood chips? Is it wood shavings? Many continue to call it sawdust. Uh, I want to kind of clarify what some of these mean as we go through the next 35, 40 minutes or so, uh, so that we are all on a better page, more similar page about the difference in wood materials. This is a photo of uh, an article that was published 2010, five years ago, which was about five years after I first started working with wood. And there are many other articles in trade magazines I could have chosen to highlight to, to, to address this question that we as an industry have seen. Uh, and that is, is wood viable? Is wood here to stay? Is wood good? And, and I always like to kind of start looking backwards before we look forward. So, so this has been in the media for a long time about the use of wood products or the potential of wood products. And one of the things I think that has preempted a lot of this uh, interest is uh, cost savings as it relates to the increasing cost of peat moss uh, due to transportation and due to those seasons, especially 2011 and a little bit in 2013 when the peat supply was, was greatly diminished uh, due to wet weather in Canada for those two summers. And when we're in short supply or when, when fuel costs rise uh, independently of the short supply, those two things together or, or independently uh, cause uh, increases in our price of peat moss, especially the further south you get, you get into the United States. So for these reasons is, is why wood is, kind of, is of interest. In my opinion, it is not because peat is not sustainable or because the peat is not being harvested improperly. Uh, I applaud the great efforts that they are doing in Canada uh, in, in properly managing their peat. So that, in my opinion, is not the reason. It is simply just a lack of supply due to rain, occasionally and for transportation costs. So, so thinking of wood, again, this is, I, I ask this question a lot about people's thought and perception of using wood in, in horticulture in general. I kind of start, start broad. And one of the things that's often mentioned is as a mulch, using wood as a mulch and, and a couple of slides here showing wood chips used to mulch landscape beds, which is something that has been and is continuing being done and then there's the question of, well, do these fresh wood chips start to tie up nitrogen? And then we have to deal with the perception or the common knowledge that the use of any fresh wood material, be it in soil or be it in substrates, is going to cause some irreversible negative effect on plants due to nutrient immobilization. And then that's, that's good. Those are good concerns. And we'll address those some today as well. Uh, now, let's, let's kind of focus more on the substrate side of things. These are just some, some examples of substrates that I took at a trade show that I was attending in Nottingham, England in 2007. And this tree is a wood fiber here in the center uh, is the first example I want to give you relative to where we are in the world about using wood fiber. As I mentioned, this photo is now eight years old and Teresa itself is no longer being produced from, from all I gather. Uh, with my sources in, in Europe. But I do know this, having traveled to Europe three times this year and more than eight times in the past five years, specifically on substrate-related ventures, that the use of wood fiber in Europe has been, has been invented, and I would say that they invented the use or at least started exploring the use of wood fibers as, as early as the 1980s, late 1980s, and certainly by the 90s, there were commercial products and there were growers using these materials. It wasn't until about 2004 before the idea made it to the United States and we started investigating its potential here. So Europe has been ahead of the game for this for, for a couple of decades at least. And even though this Teresa wood fiber is not currently being processed, I did actually go visit the Teresa facility in Hamburg, Germany in 2006. And as part of that, I was there to learn how these wood products are being commercialized. Because until we understand how to commercialize any new product and how to make it reproducible and consistent, then it doesn't matter how much research we put into it or how much we tout its goodness, it doesn't matter if we can't make it. So going on the commercialization process 
processing quest, I visited the trees of plant and learned a lot about how the wood was being handled, what species of wood was being used, was it being stored outdoors? In this photo, you can certainly see it's being stored outdoors, exposed to the elements and to the weather. And this is inside of that facility where, uh, due to a process called twin screw extrusion, which I'll show you a photo of in a minute, you can see that the wood fiber is being produced. And it's a slightly different color between a light blonde to a brown, and, and they have mechanisms by which to change the wood color uh, using a little bit of brown coal and some other products have been used as well to, to do that discoloration of the blonde wood fiber. And the only reason that any wood fiber is discolored is not for its, its use or its, its, its effect on a plant or on a substrate, but it's simply consumer preference because growers, or more importantly, consumers of plants expect their soil, quote unquote, to be brown. So, so having a blonde soil is not something that they think the consumers are ready for, and I would agree with that. So, so that's why you may see some different colors. Uh, the bottom right-hand photo I just took this past May uh, when I was visiting a facility in Northern Ireland, uh, about 45 minutes north of Belfast, and they're producing large quantities of wood fiber, uh, even in countries where trees are not nearly as prevalent as they are in the United States, which is even more convincing to me as to why we are sitting on a gold mine of opportunity uh, based on the resources we have and the amount of work that's being done. Uh, this is an up-close photo of the mounds of, of wood fiber that has already been produced at the facility. And as you see here, what's interesting to me is that, that there's no special care given relative to the bagging or the storage of these materials out of, the, out of rain. They are stockpiling it just as they would pine bark, for example, in an outdoor area. Okay, speaking of different materials, and these are six materials that either we have processed and engineered ourselves here at NC State uh, on this tray, or these are some materials from Europe that I've gathered through the years and I've gotten pretty good at bringing back samples into the United States and also have collaborated with many producers of wood fiber to send me samples in my attempt to really start characterizing these materials. Because re despite them working, some working, some not working, in my opinion, have to get on the same page that wood is not wood is not wood. And even though wood is good and wood can be used that as a grower or a manufacturer, you cannot expect them to always be the same. So take a look at this photo and here's six. And the question is, usually when I show this photo is, well, which one is best? And there is no answer to best because each of these products will work differently, both from a physical standpoint when blended with peat, as well as a chemical standpoint, meaning the pH adjustment and the biology of microbial degradation and nitrogen tie-up. So when it comes to uh, what is the best one, what is normal? Well, I, I love this cartoon. You know, normal is nothing more than the setting on a dryer, according to this cartoon. And I could not agree more that normal is a word that we should get beyond and actually start asking asking ourselves what properties do we want and which wood fiber or for that matter which substrate component that is available can give us our desired outcome. Now why are they not normal? Why are all wood fibers not the same? Well this can be said about many other organic materials but certainly today just talking about wood the reason that they're not all the same is is what you might think size. Well some of these are larger particles than others. Wood chips versus shredded wood. The shape. The shape makes a tremendous difference in how particles fit together once they are blended together and put into a container and begin to form that matrix, like we like to call it, uh, in a container, which then creates the porosity, the air and the water relations. So the shape has a huge factor. And then structure, uh, internal structure, external structures. Some materials do not have any internal uh, structure, if you will, that can hold water or air, whereas other materials have lots of those spaces, those crevices. So this is one of the things that we're working on is to recharacterize particles, organic particles, uh, in substrates and then better understand how they work. And this comes from the premise that we have all, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain, have taken some level of soil science or some soils course in our lives, and we have to learn soil texture and soil shape, and, and they, have, they have characterized these things beyond belief, and there's some like auricular and irregular, flake and fibrous, ligmental, cylind cylindrical, oh my goodness, aggregate, all of these different shapes. Well, 
Ladies and gentlemen, there are no shape descriptions, there are no characterizations that have been made of organic particles, even though we rely on them to fit together, to fit together nicely to create the, the environment that we want. So we're working on that uh, very carefully, very interestingly, very excitedly, and uh, hopefully we'll come up maybe with some parameters of what does it mean to have different size, shapes, and structures of particles, and how does processing and engineering of organic materials, peat, bark, wood, coconut coir, whatever, how does, how does that fit into this? How can we make substrates better by better understanding their particles? Look at this photo. This is a, a, a compilation of photos I've, I've tacked together that I have taken in the past, oh, about eight years, going back looking at all these photos and when I took them. Uh, and again, this photo is simply to give you an idea that wood is not wood, even though any one of these materials uh, can be used, has been used, and I can count one, two, three of these materials on this screen. Are, are mass produced, commercialized, and they sell hundreds of thousands of cubic meters or cubic yards. So, so there's a lot of, of production going on, but they are quite different. Uh, speaking of the processing and what we're trying to do to better understand how wood fiber is made, we invested in, thanks to uh, some funding coming from the Tobacco Golden Leaf Commission here at NC State, or in North Carolina, I should say, we invested in a larger scale facility for processing organic materials. The reason for this is that no, inst no academic institution uh, has a large scale, more similar to a commercial grade processing uh, facility to do some of these grinding and screening and shaking of wood and bark and other materials. So we uh, invested the time and the money and we, now we have a, a unique facility that is, is, is something I am very proud of and we have termed it the uh, Substrate Processing and Research Center or SPARC for short, so the NCSU SPARC. So this is located here on campus directly behind the J.C. Ralston Arboretum about two miles from, from central campus. And this is, is kind of just an overview of, of kind of how that process started and, and building this facility that now houses uh, equipment, uh, not as large as some of the manufacturers, but certainly large enough that I think our research can better be extrapolated to what a commercial manufacturer may be exhibiting or may be showing. So all kind of grinding and screening devices here that we're looking at for these particles. Okay, so, so back to wood substrates specifically. Pine tree substrates is one of the names that has been used over the past oh, eight or ten years or so, as well as clean chip residual or whole tree. Many different names to describe the grinding of, of whole pine trees, whether they include the limbs, the needles, the branches, the bark, the wood, or not. Uh, the variation within these products is small, and these products have been researched extensively beginning at Virginia Tech in 2004, at Auburn University 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, probably still some going on today. I've continued it here at NC State University and others have worked with these materials as well. And the first thing I would say relative to how to make any wood material is that feedstocks matter. And feedstocks being whatever material coming from whatever tree source or wood source or forestry biomass uh, source, is it shavings as the top left of this photo illustrates, is it splinters, is it chips, is it chunks, uh, where is the wood coming from, how is the wood being processed. And, and on, on this photo I show you these five particles simply to illustrate that a chipper, a wood chipper that was used to, to take a, a harvested pine log 20 feet long, run it through this chipper, you expect that the, the, the machine is going to give you a consistent particle size throughout all of that 20 foot log and the answer is, is that it does not. And this is some of the, the variation that occurs in those wood chips coming through that chipper of that one log. Now what does that matter? Well, that matters in the sense that because of the different shapes and thicknesses of these particles, when they are processed through a hammer mill, for example, the, the shapes will, will change how that hammer mill actually processes them. All right, uh, another photo just showing more of the large-scale harvesting of, of trees, how they can be chipped in field, even rolled in on rail cars, which came right through NC State University's campus when I took this photo at the bottom left and showing you the, the wood chips at the bottom right. So lots of different ways to process wood. Uh, here's wood being delivered at a site for further processing. And here you see four examples of, of different commercialization facilities that I visited over the past few years that show wood chips being stockpiled, either brought in by rail car, by by tractor trailer or chipped on site where trees were harvested before being further processed. 
Now, relative to the, the machinery and the different types of processing, this is the, the one of the main things that makes wood not wood not wood. And this is also one of the separating factors that makes the European wood fiber that's being used different from the United States wood fiber that's being currently produced. The top left is a, is a hammer mill. In this particular photo, then we've got a twin screw extrusion as well as a couple of the twin disc refiners that all fit into to larger scale or different machinery for the purpose of grinding wood. Uh, just up close to some of these, a swinging hammer mill, as you can see here, once turned on, these hammers will swing and spin very, very quickly, and they beat material as it falls from above, gravity fed. And until that material is sm small, small enough to fall through the screen, then it continues to be beat. So with the changing of the screens, ideally in a hammer mill, you can change the particle size of any product. Now, this is great for the United States because there are thousands and thousands of hammer mills that have been used here for many years to grind feed for livestock or to grind bark for, for bark producers, but in, in Europe, not so much. In Europe, and this, by the way, this is a photo of the hammers as they pass by the screen to show just how small the particles can be. But in Europe, they primarily use what's known extruders or extrusion, either single or twin screws that actually twist in, in alternating uh, rotations and different rotations and wood chips pass between them and really get ripped apart or defibrized. Twin disc refiners I've seen in many different facilities uh, designed for other purposes but have been tweaked and utilized and modified for the use in, in wood fiber production. Uh, these all make different materials. You could take three trees standing side by side, cut each one, chip them up or shred them up and process them through any of those machines and you would end up with very, very different products. This, for example, is a photo with, with one, two, three, four, five, six different wood materials that have been made with different machines or different screen sizes. And if you would, as you can imagine, from the splintery all the way down to the blockular at the bottom, the uh, material at the top I just highlighted is going to react and behave much, much differently than the material that I just highlighted here that's small or blockular. Now, what I did not say is that that material that's highlighted then, right now, and the one above it that's more fibrous, like, like fluff, those came from, from two trees harvested at the same time, just processed in different ways. This photo shows an illustration of some of the materials that's passed through our lab here at NC State the past five or six years, again, illustrating the variation of these materials. European and American, this is a photo I put together this past summer of 11 materials, all are 100% wood. Uh, despite the color, the one at the bottom right looks like cotton, but it's not. It's actually wood fiber that's spun that fine or that thin and clumped together. Despite the color, these are all wood products, all with very unique potentials and opportunities that quite excite me. Many of these are commercials. Other, others are experimental in their nature at this time. And we are working to characterize these materials from a particle standpoint, from a nitrogen immobilization standpoint, from a physical standpoint when blended with peat, as well as, as trying to work on how to characterize the particles. So hopefully we can push forward with better characterizing these coming up. Uh, using and managing substrates in wood. Going back to kind of the current status of the United States as I see it now, we have manufacturers who are beginning to offer products uh, here in the States, others who are, who are well within their R&D program and soon to, I think, release commercial products. Whereas I said before that hammer mills have predominantly been the machinery of choice in the United States, there are some investing com or some companies who have invested in some of the fiber making techniques that I mentioned earlier that are currently being used in Europe. So we will see not just hammer mill made products, but also I think some of the fiberized products coming from other technologies. For example, one of the things that I have seen with the really true wood fiber, and this is, is a photo I took this past summer, uh, is the, these fibers are so, so small. And when, the, when moisture is introduced to them, they tend to clump up. And when they clump up, it makes the blending of peat extremely difficult. And look at this photo. This was me blending this, not paying very close attention to breaking up those chunks. And I, instead, I was just dumped in the wood. I dumped in the peat, started blending it as I normally would in a mixer. And that is the best that it was able to be mixed, which obviously is, is not good. Uh, it's certainly unacceptable. This next slide kind of shows what I mean. When water is applied to a true wood fiber, it clumps up into these little balls that is very difficult to ever re-separate them again, much less blend them into a peat material. 
So this is the example uh, that I kind of set up in stage to further illustrate how wood fiber doesn't blend very well with peat. And you see there's there's quite a matrix that this fiber forms when blending with peat. However, there is a problem, and not a problem, there is, uh, it's not fully understood how to mechanically on a large volume blend these peats with wood fibers, but there are companies who are working on that and are making great, great progress. So my uh, suggestion and my belief is that uh, by the time any commercial product hits the market, they will be well blended and not have these issues that I'm showing. But they have had to fight through these issues and figure out how to blend these different materials together. And so some people are doing some really nice work on the blending mechanical side of this. This particular photo shows at the very top as a peat material without any wood fiber. And then as you go clockwise, 10, 20, 30, 40 percent by volume. And this photo shows the same thing on the left is 100 percent uh, peat. And then it goes all the way to the right uh, up to 40 percent wood fiber. And this is a product or a, a small trial I was working on last summer doing some more work and what the rates of wood actually do to plant growth, but also to the physical properties. And you see, certainly, there's a, there's a great difference. Looking at these materials, they look quite different, and they do behave differently, ladies and gentlemen. There is no doubt about it. They behave differently than a peat perlite mix that you may be used to using. And uh, take a look at this closer. The wood fiber, even at 10, but really when you get to about 30% ratios, you start to create, the wood fiber kind of holds together the peat and forms more of a matrix, more of a solid unit than peat perlite, which the peat and perlite remain separate, okay? And, and I think this has some very unique potentials, but also it's got a couple of, of things that you need to be aware of if you ever use these, all right? And this photo is just a, a hole, and I take my finger and I, I, I just... I just wiggled out a hole in the surface of the substrate, and and I did this because I noticed that with with higher amounts of wood fiber blended into peat moss, as as high as 20%, and certainly the higher you go, the more more severe it got. Uh, the, the, the plugs, when you're planting plugs, they didn't go in very easily. Again, the wood fibers holding together the peat in the pot differently than just peat perlite. So, so I put my finger in and I was just kind of moving it around. And, 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 and the best word I can use to describe how it felt is chewy. It feels chewy. It feels, it feels a little rubbery. It, feels, it, it gives with the pressure of your finger. And, 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 and it still holds together. And that is, is good from a standpoint of irrigation, okay? And this photo I took immediately after watering, initially watering these plants. The photo on the left has no wood fiber. The photo on the right has wood fiber. And when I watered and came across the top, the, the peat perlite splashed out of the side, even though I didn't have the hose very high. It splashed out of the side onto the floor, and the one on the right immediately sucked it up as fast as I possibly could put the water on, even cranking up the nozzle to almost full speed. It captured it and never splashed out. And that is because the fibers are holding on to that peat, and it's, it's really formed a neat bond. Uh, now, the, 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 the downside of that is automated potting machines. Uh, all of these photos illustrate mixes that have wood fiber incorporated in them. And as I mentioned, if you're using a really fine fiber into a peat mix, or if you're buying a really fine wood fiber, you need to be really aware of, of how, how, how giving that substrate is or how chewy, if you want to use that description, of, 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 of automated plugging systems, putting plugs down into the peat moss. Will it actually go in the pot the same? I don't know. I've been unable to judge this for myself, but my hypothesis is that higher wood fiber percentages may take some tweaking relative to how you get the plant in the pot because of that chewy uh, nature. Two other things I want to mention in relative to wood fiber is the use of wood as, as an aggregate. This photo, um, I finally took all the samples that I've, I've seen come through our lab in the past few years, and I put them out on a tray to give myself and others a good understanding of, of what aggregates are and the, and the array of aggregates that we have used uh, through the years, either commercially or, or on research basis. And some of these products are commercially available, others are not. But ladies and gentlemen, of course, aggregates are used more by us in, in the United States than anywhere in the world, certainly in Europe, I'll, I'll say as a, as a direct comparison, because of the structure of our peat coming out of Canada, or maybe I should say the lack of structure from our peat that we use from Canada. In Europe, they use 100% peat substrates to grow their crops predominantly. You know? And the reason for that is they have different fractions of peat of different sizes, therefore they can create the water, air balance, and relations that they want. 
the peat coming out of Canada is, is harvested in a much different way, a different material. So we get a much finer product that we need to add structure to to create the air and the water relations that we want, hence the reason for aggregates. This is another photo with biochar on the top left, a topic that I am not going to touch on for it's a whole other can of worms that has more questions than answers even after many years of research in my opinion, the top right being wood chips and the bottom being perlite. Now, with the pine wood chips, again illustrating that wood is not wood, all the fiber that I've shown you before is much different than these particles of wood. And this is something that we engineered here at NC State back in 2010. And these wood chips were designed specifically with specific wood chips at specific moisture contents, ran through hammer mills at varying screen sizes to achieve these particles that have basically no fines or fibers in them, as we've seen with the other wood products. And what I've done here is, is I've fractioned out uh, perlite, horticultural grade perlite, into different sieve fractions and did the same thing with wood to show that you can actually create uh, similar products of wood with perlite and uh, how they interact into a mix is something that a student of Dr. Whipker and myself, uh, Garrett Owen, who's now at Purdue University, he spent two years working on the cultural parameters of using these wood chips in place of perlite in greenhouse mixes. Uh, after we established the fact that we could, we could make these wood chips and that they had physical structure like we wanted to create that physical environment that we wanted, we next needed to in, in, inquire as to how production situations would change from a fertility standpoint, from a liming standpoint, and or from a, a plant growth regulator standpoint, if indeed we were to use pine wood chips instead of perlite. Uh, so, so really quickly, I'll go through a quick summation of, of kind of what we found after we incorporated and compared uh, the use of, of perlite versus pine wood chips at 10, 20, and 30 percent incorporation by volume. Now I'm just going to show you of the 80-20 uh, substrate, 20 percent by volume of each of these aggregates for both liming uh, or, or for liming for, for fertility nitrogen and for PGR. This, this graph shows the liming requirements when, when amending peat moss with pine wood chips compared to perlite. And the blue line is the, the pine wood chips and then the, the yellow line is the perlite. And this of course is shoot dry weight of marigolds, which I'll show you a photo of in a second. And you get to about three pounds in this particular experiment, three pounds per yard and the pH, or at least the plant growth response was uh, optimal for both of these aggregates, or at least I should say the plants growing in both of these aggregates. And here's, here's a, a visual representation of, of what those same plants look like that I just showed you the dry weights of. And at about that 3.6, this is actually kilograms, but at the uh, rates used in lime, the third rate was optimal for both of the plants. Now, I did not present pH data in here, and the pH data can be different uh, with wood versus perlite, but as far as the plant growth response, uh, they are the exact same. With plant growth regulator, Pacolobutrazol for this example, again, we've got shoot dry weight on the left. We've got the Pacolobutrazol drench rate uh, bottom or the x-axis. And the three rates of wood chip to perlite ratios, 10%, 20%, and 30% are represented by the lines, green, yellow, and blue. Now, we did not separate which ones are wood chips and which ones are perlite because there were absolutely no difference statistically. So we pooled and put all the data together. And what we saw is that at those three rates, regardless of aggregate type, regardless of perlite or, or wood chips, that the plant growth control, the plant height control was similar as the rates of paclobutrazol increased, showing that at using those wood chips that there was no tie up, there was no lack of, of efficacy of the PGRs. And, and we repeated this study using three other, or two other crops, excuse me, and we saw the exact same trend, that perlite and pine wood chips re responded the same relative to PGR efficacy. And this is a photo of, of sunflowers, one of the three crops that we used in repeated studies uh, to show that the aggregate type and percentage did not matter as far as plant growth. They were both equal, but that the height control uh, was the same. Now, this was quite interesting and good because there's been a lot of reports over the years that pine bark, and there's, there is some pine bark in commercial greenhouse mixes, that pine bark can, can tie up and, and, and decrease the efficacy of some PGRs. Uh, but we did not see that with wood. And, and I have some hypotheses as to why that is, and we plan to address those questions coming up in the near future. But for right now, just know that from what we have seen, that the wood itself does not tie it up. 
nitrogen requirements. Uh, again, three different crops grown, three different species, replicated, looking at uh, 10, 20, 30 percent wood chips versus perlite in peat mixes at three different fertilizer rates, 100, 200, 300 parts per million. Uh, how much nitrogen are these wood chips pulling from the system? Well, again, I'm showing you the fertilizer rates. I'm not showing you the difference in aggregate type simply because there were no difference in aggregate type. 10% of perlite or wood, 20% of the two or 30% of the two created or, or resulted in plant growth that was the same. Now, that implies that, all right, well, Brian, that means there's no nitrogen immobilization going on. There's no nitrogen coming out of the system. Well, kind of would be my response. And here's why I say kind of. The, the blocular nature, the large particle size of the wood chips themselves, uh, it has a very little, very little surface area. There's very little surface area compared to a really finely processed fiber, a wood fiber. And if you were to say, take the same percentages, 10, 20, or 30 percent of a fiber, blend it into a peat with, like we did with the chips, we would see, in my estimation, a, a different nitrogen need based on the amount of nitrogen needed uh, to, to, to accommodate the microbes attacking the fiber versus the chips. So using the wood chips specifically is, is it kind of got us on this whole notion of we need to really educate people that percentages of wood used in different situations cannot be, can, cannot be used on all wood products. So here for nitrogen, uh, of course, the 200 part per million rate produced the largest plants as far as optimal or maximal growth, more than 100 and also more than 300 parts per million. So, so we were quite excited about this, a really nice piece of work and uh, showing that regardless of, of aggregate type, we could switch over to pine wood chips, which we're still working on what the economics of producing those would be and also finding a manufacturer who can properly make them. That's the next step. Uh, but as far as cultural parameters, there's not a lot uh, or anything really to change up to 30%. Uh, we we kind of get crazy sometimes and have some unique ideas, and we decided we would take and, and color these chips, uh, kind of going back to my previous statements that with the wood fiber coming out of Europe and some here in the United States, uh, there's some colorants that are being added during the processing such that they're not blonde when they come out of the other end, but instead they're kind of a brown, more soil-like, quote-unquote. So we've actually colored these chips various colors, and I've, I've colored them white, which doesn't show up as well because of the wood being blonde, but blue and, and orange orange and green, you can do your favorite school colors or have Halloween mixes or, or what other kind of mixes you want. It could be a marketing tool, who knows, but at least it's kind of cool. But there's the pine wood chips that we've been working with a lot. And then the, uh, the last thing I want to share with you just, just briefly is the look at root growth as it relates to wood fiber mixes. One of the things that has been seen for many years on the research front from academics, but also from, from industry trials and their R&D programs and by growers, is that with certain uh, wood fiber materials and wood materials, there's been accelerated or enhanced root growth with a, with a lot of crops. So we utilized uh, several different studies, one most recently this summer, uh, using the mini horizon a three-chambered uh, root viewing device, plant growing root viewing device that we developed here at NC State to look at the root growth of young plants and how that how they can be affected by aggregate type or percent wood or any other treatment that we wanted to look at relative to, to root growth. So going ahead, what we did was took peat and blend it with 10, 20, 30, and up to 40% wood fiber. And we wanted to take a look at how the roots responded to those. And at the same time, we also grow this, grew the same plants in the same substrates and containers so that we can monitor the pH and the EC over time using the pour through method. And then we literally just trace the roots. We're still working on different methods and means by which we can collect data on these clear sided panels on plants growing. But for now, we were able to just trace them and then measure the tracings using a software program that gives us the total length. And in doing so, what we found, uh, again, moving quickly, but giving you the overall jest, after three weeks, tomatoes, the root growth was, was quite nice and pretty packed together, pretty similar across the different percentages of wood. Uh, the 10% wood did have a significant uh, increase in root growth, but we're only looking at 22 versus 25 centimeters, so, so about three centimeters. Is that substantial? Is that biologically? Is that really significant to your production? Oh, maybe not. Unless maybe you're using cell packs or really small plug trays, then the smallest amount of root growth can have 
it, you know, in, in my estimation, a greater impact. So, so root growth is good with the wood. I show you this uh, in that the, the physical property, I'm sorry, the chemical properties, the EC over time, uh, the highest EC is with the 0% wood fiber. And as the wood fiber percent increases, your ECs go down. Now, this is in contrast to what we saw with the pine wood chip data that I just shared with you. And, and as I noted, we think that with a wood fiber material, there's more microbial uh, tie-up of nitrogen. And that is indicative here of the EC drops that we're seeing over time. Have we yet to figure, have we figured out how much nitrogen is needed by wood fiber at different percentages and different wood fibers? No, but we, we are on that as we speak. So that is the next uh, critical piece of data that we want. And uh, just finishing up here, there's, here's just a pictorial showing you what those plants look like uh, in those mini horizotrons. The shoot dry weight of those plants, again, from 3.6 grams to 4.2, not much, but the increased root growth that we saw in some of the materials may have led to the increased shoot weights. But again, there's, there, this is, there are no difference. Or, uh, statistically speaking, they're all the same, which is, which is good. Uh, commercial products, this is not to promote or to endorse any of the products, just showing you what you could find yourself with a simple Google search. If you're a Google searcher, Berger wood fiber has been, their BM mixes have been uh, on the market for about three years now, I think. And they have two different mixes that they report uh, good progress, good sales, good uh, response by the industry on. This is an article from Greenhouse Grower back in April of this year where pit moss wins on Shark Tank. Now, I am not personally very familiar with pit moss, but pit moss is, is a product that won money on the, on the, fa on the uh, popular TV show Shark Tank. And, and they are working and promoting their product very, very highly. I cannot speak of it uh, specifically at this time, but maybe at a later date. Klassman, uh, which is European company, the largest substrate company in Europe, holistically, I think, and all of its products. They have a, a branch down in Miami, Florida, as they're moving into the United States market, but they have a green fiber as well. And one of the things I've also been seeing is compressed bales of wood and, and how to ship these around. Uh, where this came from, I'm not sure. It just came into our lab and comparing it to peat and to quar as far as how to, to navigate and how to move these wood fibers to production facilities to be blended and mixed in different mixes. So keep in mind as we as we close here that just as we all know that peat is not peat is not peat and there are many different fractions sizes and shapes of peat the same is, is true in this example shoot showing the peat from four different producers in Canada as we broke them down, separated them out, and looked at what differences there are with, with among companies or between companies, and there's even some differences there. We know vermiculite, if you use vermiculite, and I think not as many people may do that now as they used to, but certainly highly used in a lot of areas, a lot of specific substrates. Vermiculite is, is like everything else. It comes in varying particles and shapes and sizes. We all know per perlite comes in varying particle shapes and sizes, and and bark does the same thing as far as different bark materials coming from different places. They are not the same. And please, please, please do not think that they're the same. And lastly, hopefully in the last 45 minutes, you will see that wood is not the same either. And in conclusion, I would say that while uh, I, I firmly believe in this product, I think it will change floor culture first and then other industries within horticulture. Uh, I see it coming. I see it being a very good thing. I think growers need to be aware that there are some slight changes or tweaking that may need to occur as it relates to either watering or, or, or plugging new plants into the mix. But there's, there's the potential there that we all, I think, should at least look at th these products. Uh, looking at where Europe currently is and their use of wood fiber and wood products is, is far advanced than we are relative to acreage and, and, and tons and meters produced. And uh, if that's any indication of what's coming to the United States, then uh, we're going to see these very soon. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And I will stop it for questions.